Γεια σα! Να το κάνω έτσι μακρόσυρτα, να το πω μακρόσυρτα, να το ευχαριστηθώ, να το χορτάσω. Γεια σα λοιπόν, καλώ ορίσατε για άλλη μια φορά εδώ στον υπέροχο, στο μαγευτικό, στο φαντασμαγορικό, στον εξωτικό χώρο του Trace and Chase για άλλο ένα επεισόδιο των Lost Tapes με την υποστήριξη τη Τύχημαν. Και επίση, εκτό όλων αυτών, σήμερα θα διαψευστεί μια παροιμιώδη, μια αποφθεγματική φράση που λέει ότι το ποτάμι δεν γυρίζει πίσω. Πριτς δεν σφάξανε, γυρίζει και παραγυρίζει το ποτάμι πίσω. Πιστεύετε ότι ήταν γρίφος αυτά που είπα προηγουμένως. Εάν το πιστεύετε, ειδού ο γρίφος τώρα θα αποκρυπτογραφηθεί. Well, well, well. Long time no see you. Too long. David Rivers. Too long. Too long. Good Thank to be back here with you. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you for the, for the honor. Welcome back. Thank you. In a country, in an environment uh, that you like very much. And the people here. It's a mutual like love. like you very much. It's a, it's a mutual love. It's um, a mutual, yeah. It's good to see you again. We need to put up a, a before and after photo from when I saw you in 97 to seeing you now, because you haven't changed. <laughs> no, we, we met each other with him. We met each other when it was some years ago that you came here in Thessaloniki to play with the veterans. Yes, so. yes, that's right. That's right, it's a beautiful uh, time. However, uh, we feel betrayed because you prefer to live in Italy and not in Greece, uh, since you decided to stay in, uh, in Europe. <laughs> quietly, I do have a villa here in Greece. Ah. What? Where? No, I'm joking. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but let's go political one second. You're running for parliament. If you win, I'm going to buy a villa in Crete, and that's where I'm going to live. <laughs> so the pressure's Thank on. Thank you for the compliment. <laughs> yeah, but but uh, is it easy uh, for, uh, for an American uh, to, to decide to, to change totally his life and to... Uh, to stay permanently in another country where he played, okay, it's not uh, an unknown kind of... No, listen, it's a mentality. Um, if, you, if you go into any foreign country with an open mind, and we obviously will talk sports, um, you know, coming from the U.S., you know, where sports are supposed to be superior, you know, when I came to Europe, you know, I came from a superior market, but my mentality was one of respect respecting the culture, uh, learning the culture, um, you know, trying to be part of the community. So when you have a mindset like that, uh, you can live anywhere. And here we are. Uh, what, what is the, the first thing that uh, comes into your mind from your three years stint in Greece with Olympiakos in two different periods? There Fans. Is a... Fans. 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 Always number one. Fans, Olympia Coast fans are are fantastic. The the Greek fans of sports in general, I think, are really unique. So it's it's always the fans. Uh, beautiful memories, beautiful memories of the fans. Rome and what happened there in uh, April '97 is a special part of your life, of your, not only of your career. I mean, the, the, your achievement. Yes. Yes, uh, when, you, when you look at that moment, and I was reflecting on it, knowing that I would be here with you. Um, uh, I love the name, too, Trace and Chase. I love that. Whoever came up with that name, give them a raise, okay? Is this my camera? Give them a raise. <laughs> no, it, it's, you know, it's such an important part of my history and legacy. Um, and when I was reflecting on that moment, And I met the gentleman one time that came up behind me and put me on his shoulders when I had the cup in my hand. Um, that's an iconic moment. Yeah. And for me, that was indicative of the connection and the relationship that I had developed with the fans. Before, before going to the past, uh, mm. what are you doing now? <laughs> You make several things. Yes. Uh, basketball and not basketball. Yes. Um, well, my passion has always been sports and education, working with youth all around the world. I've been doing that for over 25 years. Uh, right now, we're in the midst of launching an academy 
in the south of France with connections to Florida and the U.S. Um, so that's ongoing right now. We're going to launch uh, this summer uh, with programs in Florida and Toronto. Um, Global Sports and Education Academy Partners uh, is the name of the organization. Um, actually working on a project with Theo Papalukas, uh, Euro Hoops. Um, we're going to be uh, working on a showcase for this summer under 19 in June. Um, so that's got us, you know, busy. Um, a lot of things um, that people don't know is that I have involvement in the film movie for, industry. For, 14 Knots. Yeah, 14 Knots is a project that I'm involved with as an executive producer. Um, it's a great, great uh, project because we're highlighting the issues that military veterans have when they come home uh, from a tour of duty, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, particularly in the U.S. where, you know, the services to the soldiers are not uh, well known uh, when they come home with issues. And it's a very, very serious problem. So this film is to highlight that. And um, we have, you know, our great, uh, example of talent in Greece, George Andalopoulos. Um, you know, he's a feature in this film. So um, I'm excited about that. Going to do some great things. When will be the film? Uh, uh, we, we probably are a good nine to 12 months out. Um, it's a lot of, you know, production, pre-production work right now. Uh, so, but it's something that's big screen. A lot of top actors will be attracted to it, so we're excited. Should it be challenging for you to play a role in the film? Me? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think there are any... I, I, any... <laughs> I'm asking because, because I remember that uh, not only in Greece, but I think also in, uh, in Turkey, when you play for Tofas Bursa, uh, the, uh, the media uh, wrote once Sidney Poitier. <laughs> oh, that's a huge... You, you look like Sidney Poitier. That's a huge compliment. The late Sidney Poitier. <laughs> yes, yes, that's a huge compliment. A uh, wonderful trailblazer. Um, but maybe, uh, short of myself, maybe I'll try to find somebody like Denzel. He, he, he's a bigger ticket <laughs> yeah, than me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's start from the beginning. Uh, you were born in New Jersey? Jersey City. Uh, one of 14 kids. Nine girls, six boys. Yeah, same parents, was, mom and dad. It was t tough? Very hard. It was very hard. But at the time, um, it was very hard for my parents. Yeah. Uh, for my brothers and sisters and myself, you know, they made it easy. Um, you know, I didn't know we were extremely humble in our economics. Uh, I never saw any of the struggle. But, um, you know, my father was a great example, working two jobs. Uh, saw him maybe one or two hours out of a day. And my mother, she was working as well. So, uh, you know, it was one of those situations where the oldest took care of the next oldest and it trickled on down. And that's how we... Apart from, from playing basketball, first in the high school and then the college, uh, and later you became professional. Uh, did you make any job? Yeah. During the summer or whatever? Absolutely. Working for some... Uh, Absolutely. I, um, I was what you call back in the day a runner for Wall Street Reproductions. Um, that's how I helped pay my way through high school yeah. because St. Anthony uh, High School was a private school and it had tuition and it was something like $3,000 back then. And, you know, my, my family didn't have that money. So Coach Hurley helped me get a job and I used to run documents between Jersey City and Manhattan to uh, Battery Park, and that was my job. That's how I helped pay my tuition. Uh, it was fun. Uh, how was it, uh, the situation uh, back then, playing for Notre Dame and Digger Phelps? It was great. It was, uh, for me, it was when college sports was probably, you know, at its best because it, it was just so dynamic and, you know, there wasn't so much business into yeah. it at that particular time, even though schools were making millions a year. Um, but playing for Coach Phelps at Notre Dame was, was my first introduction to the game as a business. 
Uh, he really spent a lot of time with me explaining how everything was connected and how it really worked. Uh, invaluable experience uh, aside from getting my degree in psychology. Tremendous experience. There is a special date. Uh, I don't know how, how to say, uh, how to give uh, an identity on this day. 24th of August, 1986. Yeah. Yeah. That, uh, that day... Um, Might be f fatal for you. Yeah, yeah, that was a test of, of my faith and character yeah. that day uh, with my great friend Kenny Barlow, Ken Barlow, who we all know love here in Thessaloniki. Um, you know, we were in that, that car accident. Um, you know, there was a drunk driver, you know, involved. We were just finishing up, you know, our, our summer work. You know, that job at, at that time, we were in the catering business. So... <laughs> So Kenny Barlow and I, we would drive in the truck, uh, go to catering jobs and serve food. Who was driving? Kenny, Kenny was Kenny, driving. Kenny, yeah, Kenny was yeah, driving. Yeah, Kenny was driving. And um, you know, it was late in the evening and you know, we met a drunk driver uh, out on a country road. And um, you know, fate happened. You know, we were you know, in a head-on collision just about and Kenny was controlling the van and we started to go off road and old country gravel road and you know we just lost control of the vehicle and it just started rolling it just started rolling and you know i went through the windshield uh, landed in a ditch upside down uh, didn't know it at the time but you know i was pretty much cut in half yeah. and uh meanwhile kenny and i we joke about it today I got the easy part because I went through the windshield. He stayed in the van and he was tumbling in the van like in a washing machine. Yeah. And, you know, Kenny's <laughs> 6'10. <laughs> so he's 6'10. He's telling me the story about he's in the van and it's, you know, tumbling in this cornfield. It's the middle of the night. And um, he got one little scratch <laughs> on, his, on his calf. And, uh, but uh, that was an amazing uh, experience for me. Uh, but you, know, you, you, know. you had uh, major injuries. And um, I think that you still have uh, in your, into your leg. Uh, well, no, the, no. The, the biggest injury was the, was the cut. I was cut from yeah. side to side and, you know, I was holding my organs in my arms, uh, basically. Um, so everybody thought it was over. Uh, but yeah, it was just, you know, a little scratch on my leg, but the big cut was... Do you think that uh, it did cost to your career into the NBA? Um, no. The, the injury or whatever? No. I would say it had an impact. Yeah. It, it had an impact because one, you know, people thought I wouldn't walk normal again. They yeah. definitely think I would ever play again. And for me, uh, once the doctors told me that I would live, um, everything else was just natural to me. I was going to walk again. I was going to run. I was going to play. And I ended up uh, playing that same season. Didn't miss a game. How was this the situation when you entered the NBA? You've been selected uh, number 25 by the Lakers in 1988. And you, you came very close to winning the championship since the Lakers lost to Detroit Pistons. Yeah, yeah, I still that have season. a contract out on for most of those Pistons. They ruined my rookie year. <laughs> no, listen, that was... Um, Number one, getting drafted by the world champion of the Lakers uh, with those guys, Riles and Kareem and Magic and Worthy and those guys, um, all legends today, Byron Scott, who we all know here in Greece as well, Michael Cooper, uh, AC Green. You know, those guys were special. And as a rookie, it was, the draft was great. I, that was a dream for my parents and my family. We move on. But playing with the Lakers that year was, you know, an invaluable learning experience because, you know, Pat Riley, he had his philosophy and, you know, he was a man about it. I remember clear as day, he's, you know, first day he said, David, I don't like rookies and you're not going to play very much. Mm. And, you know, me being quiet, I'm a rookie, I'm humble. I just look at him and I'm thinking, I'm going to make you play me by how I work. And uh, 
And there were times in practice where he would just come up to me and say, David, you know, you really just need your own team because I'm not going to play you. But yet I would dominate practice. And I respected him for that because he was a man about it and I knew what I was up against. So for me, that was my challenge. Go into practice, dominate, show them I deserve time. And I did play uh, here and there. And, you know, I helped win them some games. Um, but no, it was so invaluable learning, being next to Kareem and Worthy and Magic and having Riles watch him how he conducts a meeting. Uh, most people don't realize what goes into winning a championship or competing for a championship. Uh, it's not just the players. It's not just the coach. But Pat Riley would actually have meetings with the wives and the families mm -hmm. because come playoff time, the mentality changes. And James Worthy would always talk to me about it. And he would say, David, uh, now it's time for superior basketball. And so we were having conversations about superior basketball. And with Coach Riley in the war room, we were having conversations about deliberate force. Mm -hmm. So that's where we would isolate people on a team. We would literally target people on a team and we would apply what was called deliberate force. It was either magic doing something to somebody or Kareem or Worthy. It was strategic. <laughs> so I got to watch all that and that shaped, you know, my business approach and my strategy approach, um, you know, for the game. It, it was truly priceless, priceless experience. Over there is a jersey with a number 32. Yeah. How, how did you manage? Or how, how did you try to defend him on the practice? Um, you know, Mag he had Mag size, Johnson. he had height. Yeah. But I was super quick. So wherever that ball was, I was going to be in front of him. So my job was to at least make him conscious and worried about me in practice. And so yeah. that was our relationship. I would push him in that way. And um, obviously... You know, he would need to keep up with me on the offensive side. But um, that's, a, that's a guy that has an amazing work ethic, and he truly does see everything on the court. Um, so it was great watching him and learning from him. I discovered a, a statement made, made by Karim Abdul-Jabbar. Uh, he said, Rivers has a unique pendulum-like move, moving his right and left hand. <laughs> Did he ever tell to you personally? Or he just made, made the statement, a public statement? Yeah, it was a public statement because, yeah. the, you know, we're in a locker room, right, with, with the legends, the real legends yeah. of the game. And you don't give anybody an edge, an inch, because they know you will take that and you will go after them and use it. So we loved each other. We had great times. I was assigned to Kareem as a rookie. Yeah. So at training camp, you know, I had to get up like five in the morning to go get his specific New York Times newspaper. Uh -huh. He had to have it. You know, when you're on the <laughs> island in Hawaii, you know, you're not getting a whole lot of New York Times newspaper. So I had to be the first to get his to make sure he had it. And uh, I would wake him up with it every morning, uh, slamming it against his door. Um, but no, we, had, we admired each other. Uh, they knew um, my work ethic, and they gained respect for me in that regard. And um, when I got in the game, I, I did what I needed to do. Uh, but Riles wasn't budging. <laughs> Clippers, uh, 89, 90, 91, 92, was uh, totally different situation. Same city, but... Completely no. different. So, so imagine as a rookie, I'm thrown into a championship organization yeah. with all the great legends. Then my next year, um, I get traded. I get put on the trade block because the Timberwolves are the expansion team that year. Yeah. So it's a choice between me and Byron Scott because I had multiple years on my contract, along with Byron at the time. And um, so who are you going to put up, you know, for the expansion yeah. draft? You're going to put the rookie. 
And so I went from the Clippers, from uh, the Timberwolves to the Clippers. And if you, if you research it, the year I came out, the Clippers, we had maybe nine of the first round picks that year on that team. Yeah. So we were young. Danny Manning, Gary Grant, Charles Smith, um, uh, Norman, oh, I forget Norman, uh, Benoit Benjamin. Benjamin. Um, but we had nine, so we were out of control. We were young, out of control, and crazy. Uh, but we almost made the playoffs that year. I think we did make, yeah, we almost made the playoffs that year. So completely night and day. Um, a bunch of young, up-and-coming superstars versus the legends with the Lakers. Um, it was a great experience. Uh, Glenn Rivers was, yeah. was my teammate. Uh, I'll never call him Doc because I was the first Doc. Ah, oh, you were. Yeah. I was the first. I'll tell you a quick story. Later, later on, during the interview, I will take... I will give you, I will tell you a story okay. about that, because I which have is a, connected with Olympiacos. I have a great story with him, uh -huh. uh, and it, it's, a, it's a testament about first to market. He was at Marquette University. Marquette, he was, yeah, yeah. He was a senior, and I was a senior um, at St. Anthony's. He was my counselor at camp, and so I always signed my name, David Doc Rivers. <laughs> And he's the one handing out the uniforms for the camps and blah, blah, blah. He's reading. He's like, David Doc Rivers, who's that? <laughs> I said, that's me. He said, you're not Doc Rivers. He said, I'm Doc Rivers. And I said, no, you're not. I said, I'm Doc Rivers. And true story, he won't deny it because he's a great guy. We played a game of horse for the yeah. name. Yeah. <laughs> and back then. He won. Back then, I won. I had so many tricks I was doing with the ball. I won the game of horse, so I said, the name is mine. And true story, he said, okay, young fella, the name is yours, but I'm going to get to the NBA first, and I'm going to coin the name. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what he did. <laughs> Great guy, super guy, super teammate. You know, by the way, it was a confusion when it came to Olympiacos 95, summer 95. There was a rumor that Rivers is coming to Olympiacos and everybody... <coughs> Thought that time that was Doc Rivers. Thought it was him. <laughs> it's a good thing it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, no, uh, fantastic guy though. Did you did you get more confidence uh, winning the CBA championship and uh, being awarded the uh, MVP of the league? Um, after your stint with the no, the my Clippers? my confidence was always there. Yeah. Um, Again, I started looking at the game from a, from a business standpoint with my experience with the Lakers and subsequently the Clippers. Um, when I went into the CBA, um, you know, I went into the CBA with a huge chip on my shoulder. Like, I didn't belong here. Yeah. And, you know, my agent at the time was like, David, just go there. You'll be there for a few weeks and you'll be back. And it took a little longer. So everything I did in the CBA, we won the championships, MVP, all that. And at the time, Kenny Barlow, and you remember Michael Young, who was playing in Limoges. In Limoges you know, they were like, David, David, because Michael Young was a teammate with the Clippers. Yeah. Um, so he was like, David, come to Europe, come to Europe. And I was like, no, Europe is not for me. I belong in the NBA, blah, blah, blah. I didn't know anything about Europe. And so... Um, Flip Saunders was my coach in the CBA. The late Flip Saunders. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and uh, the late Flip Saunders, super fantastic guy uh, with Coach Don Zierden at the time. Um, they, was like, they were embarrassed because I was averaging like 25 really points, 14 assists. It was ridiculous, breaking records. And um, so Flip Saunders says to me one game, and we had a fantastic team, a team that could have competed in the NBA, I felt. Uh, Flip says to me, David, I don't know why you're still here, but go out and get 30 assists <laughs> and 20 points. And I'm, I know you'll get called up. Well, I, that game I went and got, I think it was 28 assists or 25 points and some. And Flip Saunders couldn't look me in the face because he was so heartbroken. And that's when I made the decision to come to Europe. Antib. 
yes. from lacrosse and from CBA to yes. join team for two seasons. Yeah. Did, did you like your first uh, steps in Europe? It was uh, something totally different? Completely. Compared to what oh, you yeah. had in, uh, in the United States? It, it was totally different. Um, the fan support was different particularly in France. I mean, you know, I was fortunate. I got to have my first experience playing for Antibes on the Riviera. Um, so that was, that was great with Jack Montclair and those guys. Um, but, you know, it was competitive, though. It was still competitive with, you know, Limoges, uh, Paris Saint-Germain was competitive. Racing was competitive at that time um, with Delaney Rudd. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, but um, yeah, just a completely different, different uh, environment. I was told that the little guys, the point guards, had their place in the game, but the real emphasis was on the big guys. And I was like, hmm. <laughs> and this was Lee Johnson. You remember yeah. Lee Johnson? Yeah, sure. Uh, telling me this. And it's like, David, that's why all the little guys, they wear the small numbers, number one or number four. And I was like, what? Really? Like, no, I'm going to change that, Lee. Yeah. And my second year, that's why I switched to number 15. <laughs> <laughs> that's because it is because you... <laughs> yes, that's why I switched. I was like, no. He was like, the little guys aren't going to make any money. Yeah. I was like, what? Really? I'm like, no, Lee, that's got to change. And, uh, yeah. and then from, uh, from the French Riviera, uh, you moved to the... Riviera of Pereus. Yes. How, how did this happen? Um, it how was really, the first contact uh, from Olympiacos it, it to bring really, you here? It really happened because uh, my first year in Antibes, we were uh, second in the finals championship, but we, were, we won the President Cup. Uh, the second year, we won everything. And, you know, I approached it as a business, and I loved those guys in France. They're like family to me today. Um, they couldn't afford the budget increase. Mm. And Jack McClare just came to me. He's like, David, uh, Olympia Coast called me. And I was like, yeah, and? And I didn't know who Olympia Coast was. I was like, yeah, so what? Um, he's like, uh, they, they want you to come to Greece. And he's like, David, we can't pay you uh, what you deserve. And he said, I know it's business. And I said, yeah, Jack, is business. But I, you know, I like you guys. I'd like to stay here if we can. We couldn't reach a deal. And so that's how I came to Olympia Coast. And the rest is history. Yeah. Oh, how was the first meeting uh, or the first practice with uh, Yanis Yanis, um, the coach? It was, it was interesting. Um, I watched and I was quiet because that was my, that was my process. First order of business, one, you go into a new country, you know, respect the culture, respect the rules, learn about your teammates and the coaching staff and figure out the formula of what I had to work with. So I'm in the first practice and um, he's already screaming. <laughs> <laughs> he's already screaming. So I'm just listening and he's, you know, it's just his way is what yeah. I learned now. Yeah, yeah. And um, I love him. I love him. And, you know, I got to say something about, about Coach. Um, because the last time I was here was for the, the, in, the, All-Star game. the induction in- to the... Induction to the Greek uh, yes. League All-Star, and, um, All-Star uh, Hall of Fame. And I got to, you know, meet and talk with my guy Dutch. And Dutch yeah. shared with me that Coach isn't doing so well. So, yeah. you know, my heart goes out to him because... You know, when I look at the first practice at a man who was so strong, determined, yeah. convinced about his way, um, but also being strong-willed and having the love for the players, because uh, he truly loved his players. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he, and he was always defending his players. Yeah, if somebody. Absolutely. Try to in practice, yeah, uh, he, he'd like, hold a knife to your throat <laughs> in practice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I would watch him and George Segalas go at it every <laughs> single day. Uh, it, was, it was wonderful because they loved each other so much. 
And, and it was just a joy to watch them screaming up and down the court, calling each other, you know, I won't say it here yeah. on TV, <laughs> on the show, but they loved each other so much. And um, uh, it was all about learning, uh, learning his style, learning his technique, um, learning how to communicate with him. And I think he discovered some things about me because our conversations were always oh, yeah. short. Yeah. We never had any long conversations long conversation. because he knew I was locked in as a general on the court. He knew that right away. So when things weren't going well, he didn't have to come to me and say, hey, this is wrong. Hey, you didn't do this or you're not doing this because I would be the first one to acknowledge it and say yeah. it. And we find the solution. Uh, but I love him. I, 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 love, I love working with him. Um, just a tremendous, tremendous character. The late Dusan Ivkovic was totally different as a personality, uh, as a coach, than uh, compared to Ioannidis. Yes. Complete opposites. Completely. Complete and total opposites. Um, Ioannidis was strong and demonstrative in his method. And, you know, that can work with some players yeah. and it cannot work with others. Um, Ikovic, he's like a giant, strong teddy bear. Uh, he come up to you real quiet, tap you on the shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> and say, well, you know, David, I think we should maybe do this this way. It would be more effective. What do you think? He tapped me. <laughs> <laughs> and suddenly. <laughs> <laughs> and I was Screaming. Like, yeah. I was like, yeah, coach. Um, yeah, let's go. Let's do it. <laughs> and, you know, it was, it was great because both of them acknowledged, you know, that I wasn't just a point guard. You know, I was learning the players' tendencies. I was learning their strengths and weaknesses. I, I, from a psychology major at Notre Dame, I was always interested in human behavior. So I learned how to speak to different players. Now, it was also something I learned at the Lakers, too. Um, Pat Riley was very uh, firm in his belief. And um, he would have conversations with players And some players, he would just be very straightforward, say, look, um, you do this this way, and that's it. It's, there's no issue, there's no subject. My way or the highway? Yeah, basically. That was basically. the dogma for That was Riles. And it was, it was that way, but in our war room meetings, we had input from everybody. But once he made a decision, that was going to be it. Um, and it was very much the same with Yanidis and, and Ikovic, but just delivered in different, you know, methods of communication. What were your, uh, your thoughts, your ambitions, your, uh, not prediction exactly, by the beginning of the 1996-97 season? Um, for me, we were winning everything. It was your second season with Olympiacos? Yes. Coach changes? Yes. It, it, and this is the part that didn't phase me because I didn't know um, Coach Ikovic. I didn't know him. Um, and I was surprised that Coach Ioannidis wasn't coming back. I was very surprised by that. Um, but I spent that year learning and knowing my teammates. So even in the off season, I was very upset that we didn't um, that we didn't get to the final four that first year. El I, eliminated to Real Madrid. Yeah, I was I was very upset because I came into the first season knowing that that was a championship that the fans wanted the most. Yeah. And so that was my goal and target. And so the second year, you know, prior to that season, that summer, that was my main focus. And I knew we were going to win it. Um, I recall clear as day talking to a journalist from the UK. It was back in um, January, January, early February. And they were asking me, David, 
uh, what do you think? Are you guys going to make it to the championship? And it was a time we were struggling a little bit, still yeah. finding our way. And I said, absolutely, we're going to win everything. And the journalist, I recall, saying to me, uh, really, you, you think you, you guys it? are going to, you believe that? I'm like, yeah, absolutely, we're going to win everything. It was because of my confidence in my teammates. Um, and I knew what we had. So that was the goal. Uh, even though we started that year up and down, I never had any doubt we were going to win. Uh, has been any, any turning point during the season that changed the mentality and the performance of Olympiacos? Because, as you said before, at the beginning of the season, the team was strangled very much. Yeah. Losing games. Uh, yes, games that we should have yeah. won. Um, the, the change was we were getting closer to playoffs. And it goes back to the experience with the Lakers. It taught me that even though you, you start the season and you're trying to win, when you approach playoff times, James Worthy called it separation. Mm. Here's where we create separation, separation by playing superior basketball. That stuck with me, and I watched them do it. If, if you recall that year, we swept everybody. Yeah. And we got to the finals with Detroit, and we got swept. We got swept. Worthy was on one knee. Kareem got hurt. Magic was out. And we were down. Uh, so that's why we got swept. But what changed for Olympia Coast that year, well, we just got closer to the playoffs and we got more locked in. We got more focused. And I knew the goal in sight and we weren't going to miss. Uh, uh, then it was, if I remember what it was from, in a point of the season when Dusan Ivkovic decides to put Milan Tomic in the starting five to play with you? Yes. Did he help you? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Because I was kind of surprised that it confused the opponents the way that it did. Milan could play the point. Milan could play the two. Yeah. I could play the point. I could play the two. So it really kind of threw teams off doing that. And obviously, we... You know, Milan and I, we were competing in practice every day together like, you know, we were, we were at each other's throats. But that was the beauty of it. We played hard, we practiced hard, and George Sigalas was the leader when it came to us practicing and playing hard. Um, and that reminded me of the experiences with the Lakers. It was a family, but when I tell you every day in practice, you know, you thought there was going to be a fight because we were going after each other so much. Uh, but at the end of practice, it was, okay, where are we going to eat? What movie are we going to see? Uh, it was that type of relationship. And when, you know, Milan and I were out there on the court together, it was, it was easy. Was there any special motivation for you to prove how good a uh, player you are? Because... I remember there was a lot of negative comments that Rivers cannot help Olympiacos, that the team uh, had no chance to, uh, yes. to win the title or to, to make it to the Final Four. Yes. I, you know, I knew that was going on. Yes, because they said it's, it's a Greek word, kolotubas. <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew it was going on. But here's the thing. When you're a pro and you know what you're here for, and I remember my first interview um, when I came to Greece. Um, people were asking me, do you think you can do this? Do you think you can do that? And I was like, yes, absolutely. And I said, I'm the guy that will create the calm in the storm. And I just left it at that. But when, when you hear these things, when things aren't going great, that's part of the business. You have to choose as a player, especially around championship time, you have to choose what you allow to rent space in your mind because your job has got to be focused on one thing, and that's winning. 
So when I was aware of all that chitter chatter, it didn't diminish my love for the game, my love and passion for the fans. I just took it as part of, you know, these, these guys, they really want this. And I knew we were going to win even during that time. I just never had any doubt. Did you ever feel the, that was a possibility uh, that the club should release you? Zero. No. Zero. And at the time, I think uh, Djordjevic's name yeah. was being mentioned as a replacement. I knew Djordjevic. And I was like, you know, let me just focus on being me. And in the end, everything will be answered. Uh, playoff series against Partizan and, and Panathinaikos. What do you remember? I mean, because of, especially against Partizan. Well, yeah, Partizan, everybody was nervous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because we had to go back there yeah. to win. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Three breaks. Yeah, and um, I was so... That was probably the most angry I had ever been about myself um, and not performing. Because if I had performed well when we were at home, we wouldn't have been going back. And uh, so I was pissed. And the whole team was pissed. Uh, pissed meaning angry. Um, yeah. and, um, and I just went completely and totally silent after that game because I was already focused on going back to Partizan because I knew what I needed to do. And I, was, I didn't talk to anyone. I was just, you know, all business. And every, a lot of people thought we were going to lose. Yeah. Everyone thought we were going to lose. Uh, no, um, no. The game at Oaka against Panathinaikos is one of a kind for you and the whole team because you beat uh, Panathinaikos by 20 points on their own home. Uh, for me, that was just part of the toll fare. You know, I knew the rivalry between the two fans was great, but I got to tell you, it, I didn't, um, and we can talk about this a little bit too, um, a lot of times when I competed, Vasilis, uh, I was not always giving consciousness to the player that was in front of me. For me, my, my opponents, they were just obstacles in my way. Um, I studied the scouting reports. I knew what players could do and what they didn't want to do. But I really didn't buy into the names, um, the, the other players. I, I never did. And so going and playing in Panathinaikos, that was just part of the journey yeah, yeah. that we needed to make to go to, to the Final the Four and to win the championships. Everything. Same thing against uh, Sasha Djordjevic in the final? I, I didn't see any names. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I really didn't. Um, I was so focused. I remember one of my old, oldest friends, um, and he is old, Roy. Roy is old. Um, he passed me as we were going through the tunnel for the first game. And um, he said, David, I said hello to you, but I don't think you saw me <laughs> because I was just that focused. I didn't Focus. talk to anyone yeah. that final four. Um, I knew we had to win two games and those two teams, they didn't have a face or a name for me. We just had to play well and win. And I knew I was a big part of that. What happened in Rome? Uh, I mean, Olympiakos was, <laughs> and you personally, Uh, like Roman Emperor, uh, dominating guard, something that the European basketball have not seen since Larry Wright drove Banco di Roma mm. in 1984, which was a special performance for the final. But the way you played in two games, the semifinal and the final were extraordinary. Well, you know, I, I had that said to me a lot. And for me, um, I was kind of surprised by it because I was playing my style of basketball, but the main goal was to play well because I knew if I played well, it was going to give my teammates even more confidence. So I was putting a lot of you know, responsibility on myself to, to get started. Uh, and 
you know, I love up-tempo. I, you know, you give me an opportunity for a fast break, I'm never ever gonna turn it down. Like the fast break <laughs> with the so popular uh, video on YouTube with a layup against Verban? Ah, <laughs> the, the three seconds or whatever, yeah. yeah. Um, you like this, this kind of game? Well, you know, I'm in the game, I know the tempo of the game, and it's three seconds, whatever, on the clock. And I'm like, okay, I know everybody's asleep yeah. on the court, they think it's over, blah, blah. And I trained, even in the off season, the game isn't over until the clocks read zero. So I'm thinking in that moment, I'm looking at the clock, mm -hmm. let me try to see if I can go to distance. <laughs> and it was just a personal challenge. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, so it happened. It, 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 it happened and it was successful. Um, but it wasn't the first time I did that. Uh, I did that when I was in Antibes. Antibes. We were playing in um, Israel. Um, it was preseason though, so it, it didn't matter. But I, I went the distance um, during a, a friendly game uh, with Antibes in, in uh, I think it was uh, Elat somewhere. Elat. Yeah. Elat. Yeah. Um, in, in three seconds. I think, yeah, 2.9 or three seconds. So, yeah, yeah, you know, you, you got to challenge yourself and you got to, you know, play the game until the clock reads double zeros. But the, the way I, I'm going back to the, to the final four, the way you play this, uh, you know, is a monumentary. You, you know, it was, it was personal yes. to me. It was personal to me. And, um, and I also knew that this, this was the moment that the fans, you know, wanted so many times and had gotten to certain points only, you know, to be disappointed. So I, I knew what was at stake. Um, and I wanted to deliver. Uh, yeah. it, you know, I don't, it, it's not just, you know, something I say uh, when I talk about the appreciation of the fans showing up every game, selling out the Peace and Friendship Stadium, uh, selling out and having fans travel with us on the road. That meant something to me. Uh, I grew up poor. Yeah. Um, so where my parents spent their money, it was carefully thought out and people were paying their money to come see. I connected those dots and that was really important for me. I remember I asked you after, uh, just, just after the, the end of the final, the end of the final game, the championship game, and you stated, now the world is loyal to me. Mm. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, you know, there's a relationship. Yeah. There's a relationship. Um, and, you know, even though we had a rocky time leading up to that moment that year, the fans still came. <laughs> Who used to be your uh, favorite teammate? With whom you have you have the you had the ideal connection and uh, the cooperation on the court. You know what? Um, I've been asked that question. You know, when you look at my teammates at Notre Dame, my teammates with the Lakers, uh, my teammates with the Clippers, I was trying to manage people. Yeah. Um, and then you, I come to Antibes, even you know with the CBA team with Flip Saunders and those guys. I approach the game in such a way where it's not just basketball, but it's also psychology. I have to learn about my teammates because I need them to perform if I'm going to be successful, if the team is going to be successful. So what I do is I build relationships. I build quiet, strong yeah. relationships. Um, So there was no favorite. I watched who naturally worked hard. I watched those that needed me to motivate them to work hard. And so if you talk to any of my teammates ever anywhere, they'll probably talk to you as if, you know, I was extremely close to them when I had that same relationship with each and every one mm -hmm. of them because everybody mattered. Um, because if we didn't have great practices, 
there was no way we were going to have great performances and games. So literally every player and every team that was on the practice floor, they mattered to me. Yeah. And I made them feel like they mattered to me. And then came the game five in the Greek League finals. It was an unbelievable all-time record, 73-38. Mm. It's still a record. It still remains a record. It'll be there for a while. Yeah, <laughs> probably. <laughs> yes. It was on one of these nights that no. you understand that I, I dominating mean, uh, at all? You know, um, and it's not about ego, but Vasilis, I literally trained in the off season, imagining doing everything that we saw. Um, whether we were winning by five, 10, or 20, the, the objective was to send a message every time. Uh, I remember we would go away for preseason camp, um, Budirio, we go to different places where other teams would be, and we'd play these friendly games. For me, it started then. Teams would watch us as we do our run on the track, and they'd be sitting on the side in the grass waiting to take the field. And purposely, when we would run by the team, we would be sprinting, and I'd be looking at them, and we'd be running 100 miles an hour, hmm. but I'd be looking at them as we go by. It was all about sending a message. Yeah. That's, how, that's when it starts. So when you get to these games, You just continue. You don't think. You continue to dominate. That's the mentality. Uh, why did you surprise? Because nobody was waiting that it might happen to leave Olympiacos after what happened in Rome. But you left. Why? That's a great question. <laughs> That's a great question. I didn't want to leave. Yeah, sure. I did not want to leave. Um, At the end of the day, we had an agreement, and a lot of people don't know this. We did have an agreement, um, but something happened. I remember Claire's day, I'm going to dinner. I had gotten used to the Greek culture by then because I was going to dinner very late. Very late, okay. <laughs> and uh, I get the call um, saying, David, we're not going to go forward with the agreement. And I'm like, okay, why? And, you know, the person that made the call is like, I don't have all the details, but I was just told we're not going to go forward. And I was disappointed. I was so disappointed. You know why I was disappointed? Number one, we were en route to becoming a true dynasty. Yeah. We were en route to becoming a true dynasty. To win back to back titles or whatever. Number two, that following summer, we were scheduled to play the Chicago Bulls. Yeah. And I was looking McDonald's forward. Over in October. Yes. I was looking forward to going to meet MJ again. Because yeah. the last time I met him, he blew by me <laughs> on the court. And I was in complete and total shock when I was with the Lakers. And um, I had never experienced anybody blowing by me the way he did. So I was looking forward to playing the Bulls with our championship team and sending a message to the whole world. Disappointed. And disappointed. then from big opponent, then you became teammate with Dominique Wilkins. Yeah. The next season in 42, though. Yes, yes. How Dominique, was they? That was, that was probably one of the best teams on paper Europe yeah, on paper. has ever seen. On paper. <laughs> Gregor Fuchka, Dominique, Carlton Myers. Jack Galanda at the time, coming in off reserves. Um, you know, just egos all over the yeah. place. <laughs> And, uh, you know, we should have won the EuroLeague championship. We really should have. Yeah. You know, that phantom shot um, taken by Danilovic um, with Dominique and the so-called foul the mysterious ghost foul. Um, I met the official, by the way, yeah. and he apologized to me. So 
we're all good, but that cost us going to the Final Four. They were very good that year. They had Ginobili, who was just yeah. becoming, you know, who he is in, uh, in the game. But um, yeah, no, that was a that was a great experience. Um, you know, just couldn't quite get everyone on the same page. There is an ancient Greek expression said by Heraclitus that river does not turn back, but rivers turn back. Yes. Yeah. And play again for uh, for Olympiacos. How did this happen? Um, well, that was bizarre too, because I came back from Turkey. Yeah, from Tofas. Yeah, Tofas. And I had signed a four year deal with Tofas. So, again, that was a place where people said, you know, don't go, David, it's terrible there, blah, blah, blah. You know, all the horrible stories. I'm like, okay, I'll go find out for myself. And I teamed up with Rashad Griffin. Uh, true big man, love him, and uh, the management was super. Um, I came back to Olympia Coast because we had won everything in Turkey yeah. two years in a row, six titles, cup, national cup, and something else they had going on there. And um, they decided to dismantle the team. And I'm like, why? No one told me the reason why. I still don't know the reason <laughs> today. And that's how I ended up coming back to Olympia. How was the second stint with Olympiacos? Um, it was uh, Ilya Zuro's uh, rookie coach. You have some, some incidents, yeah, yeah. some disagreements. We, we basically, um, we struggled to find our identity. Yeah. We really did. Uh, the team was talented enough you know, to be national champs for sure. But we, we struggled with finding our identity and rhythm, and we never got it together. Um, we, we just never got it together. And uh, it was unfortunate. It was unfortunate because the team was good. We just, we just couldn't settle on our identity. I was playing uh, with, together with Dino Raja. <laughs> big, 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 big personality. Big, big personality. Um, one of the truly most talented big men I've ever played with. Uh, he was phenomenal. Um, when he was locked in, there was little anybody could do with him. Just a super, super talented, talented guy. Um, again, we just struggled, you know, getting everyone collectively on the same page. Um, But yeah, Dino, Dino is, he's, he's a character. He's a character. My last question is related to your uh, basketball uh, philosophy and, the, and your process to the game. Uh, to, if you, in the future, you will have a book or an autobiography, uh, do you decide about the headline which express your process to the game? Well, you know, it's, it's interesting you ask that question because um, my book will probably be finished in three years. Huh. Um, my book will be finished in probably three years. It's a book slash uh, package with a documentary um, actually related to your question. I've been thinking about this for like the last two years and I finally come to settle on the fact that it's not so much the title of the book, but it's the title of each chapter of the book. Because the book talks about um, my childhood, the things that shape my, my character and personality. It talks about my early coaches that were pivotal to who I became as a player. Um, so there's no title yet. But right now, what we're working on is the title of each chapter in the book, um, because it will be a documentary as well. Uh, let's just say um, I'm very complex, uh, <laughs> very complex. But my philosophy for the game, it's, it's simple. Um, it's very, very simple. Uh, you've got to have a, a killer instinct of a mentality. Um, You know, most people today would, would label it 
the MJ yeah. or Kobe Bryant oh, mentality. Um, and that's what I practice and live. But in coaching, the philosophy is about the players. The philosophy is about communication. And the most important thing, any great one will tell you, I don't care who they are, coach, player, you meet any great one, they listen. That's the key to success. No matter what it is, the great ones, the common denominator is that they listen. Thank you very much. My pleasure, Vasilis. Thank, you, very much. Thank my, you for having my, me. My pleasure, my, uh, my honor. Same here. In Same here. We got to do something with the studio, though. <laughs> it's, it's unreal. <laughs> there's nothing like it in Europe. And I'm not sure there's anything like it in the U.S. I'm being honest. But what's missing is you got my guys here. We got to add some European legends. Yeah. We got to add some European legends on this wall. But it's beautiful, we'll fantastic. Thank you Thank very you much. Thank you for having me. Thank you much. I appreciate Αυτό it. ήταν ο David Rivers. Αυτό ήταν άλλο ένα επεισόδιο των Lost Tapes εδώ στο Trace and Chase με την υποστήριξη της Τύχημαν. Ελπίζω να απολαύσατε τη συνέντευξη του David Rivers. Ο David δεν ήταν απλός ποταμός, ήταν σκέτος χύμαρος. Mm. Ραντεβού την επόμενη φορά. Γεια σας, να περνάτε καλά.